welcome back to my channel, The Encouraging Word. Michelle here. I'm excited to get started today. The last chapter, chapter five of the book of James in the Jumping Into James series. If you've missed that, go ahead and click on this link here and I will take you to a playlist where you can see all the videos of the whole book of James. So you can learn, hey, is that one of your New Year's resolutions to get in God's word, to just go deeper with the Lord, to have him to speak to you? And do you need help? Are you are you confused about the Bible and you just want to know, oh my gosh, I, I read it and it's so confusing. Well, hey, I have made it super easy. All you have to do is check out my playlist. You can go in order from chapter one through now chapter five. All right, so hey, I'm going to be teaching today and reading out of the CSB Essentials Teen Study Bible. I have recently gotten this for my son. He's 15 and Honestly, I've fallen in love with it. I really, really love it. I love all kinds of Bibles for kids and for teenagers. I find them very, very helpful. I love all the features they have in it. So if you want to check this one out, I'll link it right here. Um, so check out that review video from a Christian mom's perspective of this CSB teen Bible. I've also done some reviews about Ken Ham's books called Answers for Kids, and they are a kind of apologetic type of books for kids that helps them learn about God, answers a lot of questions. He took um, a whole bunch of kids' questions from all around the world and answered them and put a biblical backing. And so I did a review on what I think as well as what my son thought, so check that out right here. Okay, but let's get started. All right, so open up your book to um, uh, James chapter 5, and I'm just going to go ahead and read right now verse 1 through 6 to you, and the title of this is Warning to the Rich. And now, I do want to remind you that James is talking to converted Jewish believers, so these are be uh, believers that he's communicating with, and, um, you know, so not... Not everybody uh, in the kingdom has money, but this is particularly for the people who have wealth, okay? And so it's, it's a warning to them. It's a warning. So let me read it to you and we'll dive a little bit deeper. Okay. Come now, verse one. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over the, min the miseries that are coming to you. Ooh. Wow, come now, you rich people, weep and wail over the min, min, miseries, the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Ooh-wee, Wow. You have stored up, ooh, listen to this. You have stored up treasure in the last days. Okay, he's saying here that yeah, you have stored it up. Think about what that might, what he's implying. Like you have stored it up, okay, in the last days. Verse four, look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out, cries out. So the pay that you have withheld from the workers who are mowing, you know, the people who are tending their um, uh, their lands. So the workers, their cries are crying out. Well, who are they crying out to? Who are they praying to? Who are the people who are feeling misused and abused by this, you know, this boss or owner or the landowner that, ha you know, is supposedly hiring them to do this. Well, they're crying out to God because there's some things here that are not making sense, right? There's there, there's some kind of evil action that's being done by the wealthy person, by the wealthy landowner, by the boss, the big boss, okay? So look, the pay, the pay, okay, that you have withheld from the, from the workers who mowed your fields cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So God is hearing the people's prayers and they're crying out to God because there's injustice being done. Okay. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. Ooh. 
you have murdered the righteous. Who does not resist you? Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. Some questions I want to ask you to kind of think about a little bit because this is talking about money and basically being a steward, being a good steward over what God has given you. Um, if the Lord has blessed you with finances and wealth, um, you know, wealth and finances and money in general is not a bad thing, but the love of money is the root of all evil, right? So it's about your heart's condition before the Lord. It's about how you steward what God gives you. To one person, he may give finances, but those wealthy finances, hey, guess what? It has to come with godly character. You're not going to be able to, um, you know, steward your finances well, and, and, and the Lord may not want to bless you. If you're praying and you're asking God to give you wealth and, and to give you all these kind of things that, that money can buy in society and our culture, um, and you're really expecting this from God and you keep praying and you're not seeing it coming through. Well, you know what? God is probably like, no, ma'am, no, sir. I'm not going to bless you with that because I am looking at your heart. I am looking at your motives. I am looking at your character and I can see, hey, this is not aligning. You will, I will not bless you with that. Okay. So we have to always check our motives. We have to always Ask the Lord to search our hearts and make sure that our hearts are pure before him and, and, and to realize that, yes, you know, sometimes God will give us things or we'll come into an inheritance or we'll come into things like that because even the ungodly have wealth. Obviously, you see that. And they're not good stewards over the things that God has because all things come from God. God owns all the cattle on the hill. He owns all things. And he, he lets it rain on the just and the unjust. So the wealth among uh, believers and non-believers, hey, some are wealthy and some are poor. Believers and non-believers, okay? But um, so I want you to keep in mind, though, that he, specifically James, is talking to believers, okay? So I want you to think about this. Do you recognize that all you have is a blessing from God and it matters how you use your blessings, okay? Your favor and your blessings, do you realize that all you have, it's from God. It's from God. And it can be more than a, a you know, like a financial type of blessing. It could be your talents, you know, you're using your talents and your treasures that are inside of you, you know, the, the, the giftings that God has given you. Are you being a good steward over those things? And do you realize like those gifts and talents are from the Lord? Okay. All right. Think about this. Think about this now. Do you think that God cares about how you spend your money? Okay. Do you think that he cares about how you spend your money? And how do you feel about tithing and giving back to the house of God? So, you know, I know there's controversies out there and, you know, a lot of people go to church and they don't even tithe. They just go in and go out. But I want you to really examine before the Lord and always pray. Always pray and ask God, God, what do you want from me? What do you want? Um, you know, you're, you're the steward. I'm learning that you're the, you're the giver of all things. All good and perfect things come from the Father in heaven and that, you know, you're my provider and you pro you provide for me and you want me to prosper um, and always, God, not just financially. You want me to prosper spiritually, most importantly. And I'm I'm getting into your word and I'm, I'm going to church for the first time in a long time or the first time ever. Or I've been going to church, but I feel really awkward about this whole tithing thing. And I just have, you know, I'm thinking about TV evangelists and all they want is your money and then all the all the different things that come out that you see that they're buying these big jets and planes and they're using the money like improperly. And, and so there's a lot of that there. But again, you know, when you get, when those people get those things or you get those things that you're asking for, do you have the character? Do you have the godly character to, um, to be using those things wisely? Like, do you have good character and good, you know, do you have wisdom from the Lord? So, um, you know, tithing is something that is in the Bible, and God talks about that, particularly the 10% I see a lot in the Old Testament. But it's about, you know, God wants us to be a cheerful giver. He wants us to have a generous heart. And, and so how do you feel about tithing? Are you going and using your, your gifts um, 
not only like your time and treasure and your talent, but are you also using that to bless your church financially? And are you are you giving to the Lord? Because you know, he even if you don't agree with the 10%, I mean, we strive to do 10%, but you know, even if we don't do that, the Lord knows our heart and, and where we are in our seasons, and we try to be faithful with that because. God has given us 100%. And if I get to keep 90, let's just say, and I give 10% to the church, I'm giving to the church so the church can have open doors, so the church can pay electricity, so the church can pay for water and 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 the mortgage and do all these amazing things for the Lord and, and serve in the community and by, and by the community presence and things like that at Christmas time and be like ministries going out there into the world. And so the church needs our help. And if we're believers, we should examine our hearts um, before the Lord when it comes to our finances and being comfortable and feeling like we want to be generous givers to God's church. Okay, so do you feel, how do you feel about tithing and giving back to the house of God? All right, so here's a little discussion. Listen to this. James is writing of the corruption of money and warning the wealthy in the church. Those people who have financial blessings and riches but they do not use them appropriately to glorify God. Ooh, wait. He is reminding them that there are riches that they hold so near and dear to them. They're holding it so near and dear to them. Well, they will rot away. Um, you know, they don't last forever, those riches. Uh, and they're lusting after mammon, and, and that will lead to their destruction. So this is what James is warning. James warns, um, Warning goes straight to the root of their disease, which is their unholy lust after the things of this world and not craving the things of the Lord. Okay, so God wants us to put his kingdom first, you know, his kingdom first and all these other things you worry about, all of those things the Lord is going to take care of and be added unto you. But first you worry about the kingdom of God, you be searching um, and praying and asking God, like, how do I live and put you first in my life? And if you do that, God is not a liar. He will provide all the other areas in which that you're praying for. Um, but not to store up your treasures on earth and earthly vessels that die and go away and, and rot away and get eaten by moths and get corroded. But to store up your treasures in heaven, you guys. Store them up in heaven. All right. So they are worshiping their money and status over God. This is idolatry, right? It's I, idolatry is anything that you worship and put first other than God. And so this can be money. A lot of times for people, that's the sin. It's the money part. For other people, it's, you know, idolatry comes in many forms. Um, but this is one of them, okay? They are burning for more, yet when they have, they are not satisfied. Wow. James is warning believers of the sin. So let us remember that God owns everything. Like I said, he owns everything already. Everything you have is actually the Lord's, okay? Um, and it's all his. Okay. Our bank accounts, these are the things that are his. Our bank accounts, our savings accounts, our jobs, our careers, our homes, our vehicles, our possessions, and our children, our time, treasure, and talent. All of that belongs to the Lord. There is actually nothing that belongs to you. Everything is given by the Lord. So that's sobering when you think about and when you put those things into perspective, that will really help you to refocus on the Lord and be like, oh Lord, um, am I giving too much to this? You know, am I is my desires for after these different things, whether it's money, whether it's like I want to be, you know, I want to be recognized. I, I want to have like, you know, a relationship, I want to get married, I want to have money, I want this career, you know, all these different things. Like if we're not examining ourselves and just really plugging into God, those things can um, can become idols in our lives, you know? Even sports. I mean, think about how, how sports come first to a lot of people, even in Christendom, you know? I'm not saying you can't enjoy sports on a Sunday, but I'm saying if that is more important to you to go to church, uh, not to go to church on a Sunday because you have to do all these other things constantly, then you should re-examine your life before the Lord and ask the Lord, like, Lord, you know, am I am I not putting you first? Like, am I am I not 
is this thing, are these things becoming an idol where they are becoming first? Like you, they are getting all of my attention first before you, Lord. And so, yes, a walk with the Lord is daily, but Sunday is supposed to be a day of resting in the Lord. Sunday is supposed to be a day of going to church and gathering as a church in the community and being with family and resting in the Lord and growing in the Lord. And if other things are coming and taking you away from God, then you really should re-examine your life. Okay? All right. So I'm going to just go over here. Verse 1. So come now, let's see what I put here. So come now, you rich people, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming upon you. So I just kind of thought it was interesting how I put, um, for those who don't steward or use their finances wisely as the Lord sees fit, there will, um, there will be miseries coming to them. There'll be judgment because God is going to be like, hey, I gave you this and you didn't use it wisely. And you used it on your own wicked pleasures and, and, and to promote yourself, you know? So, you know, that's why there's going to be miseries, you know? And, and they're going to cry and they're going to wail. And, and, and they should. Like the Lord, the Lord should put that on their heart. And hopefully they, have, they haven't grieved the Holy Spirit so much where they're not sensitive to God and Him correcting them through His powerful conviction spirit, you know? And um, hopefully that they're crying and... And there will, they'll cry and weep before the Lord in repentance to, to bring them back into the fold and to correct where maybe they're going astray. Um, so that's just something I thought about when I read that. Okay, verse 2, your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Um, so their wealth is, has rotted. It has not brought forth good fruit. So nothing, like what of that was used you know, okay, not only can you not take all this money with you and all your gold and your silver and your clothes and all these riches, these worldly things, that you can't take that with you. You are spirit, okay? You can't take your house with you. You can't take your money. You can't take none of that. None of that goes, as you all know, none of that goes with you when you die. So, but it's kind of like something in my heart when I was reading that was just like, wow, Okay, so you use that on your own pleasures. You use that, and, and it was almost like fruitless. Like, you, could, what could you have used that? What could they have used their money on? What could they have used their wealth on that God had provided for them? Um, you know, their nice, their nice robes and their beautiful jewelry and all of that. They can take that with them, and it was like, well, did you help the poor? Did you help the widows? Did you help the fatherless? Were you generous with your nice things? Or did you, you know, so that just had me thinking of that. And it says your gold and your silver are corroded and their corrosion will be witnessed against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Wow. And I, I just, some of my thought here was there is corrosion of the gold and silver not taking proper care of. Again, not being good stewards over the things that God had given them. You look like you've stored up all the, uh, it says you have stored up treasure in the last days. So it's like he's, these people are storing up their treasure. They're not using it. They're not being productive for the kingdom of God. They're actually not putting the kingdom of God first. And um, they're not serving the Lord in a way that is honoring to God, recognizing that he is God and he's the one giving them everything. They're just not being good stewards of it. And they're storing it up for themselves and not for the kingdom of God. And that is so sad because so many people need the Lord's help, you know, whether it was back then or now. Okay. So uh, it further, like I said, goes into, we can see that, that the people who worked for these people in the fields and the harvesters, they, there was injustice happening. They weren't getting their dues pay. And um, so their cries, their prayers, their, you know, their, their cries and prayers up to God, God, why is my boss not, you know, like, Lord, don't look, don't look away at this injustice that's happening. I can't even, I'm having a hard time feeding my family and yet they have to still work. So uh, that's just very interesting. And it says that, that, that they lived luxuriously on earth and indulged themselves. They, they're indulging themselves. Um, and in the meantime, they're not giving anything to the, the people who are working for them or, or helping the Lord do his work at all, right? You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Mm, wow, look at that right there. That's, that's 
good stuff. Wow. All right. So yeah. Um, wow. You have fattened your hearts in the day of the slaughter. So it just kind of reminds me how our hearts are deceitfully wicked and that if we don't constantly have communion with God, we're not praying, we're not seeking God's will in our lives, and we're not asking God, God, search my heart. If there's anything unclean or unpure, Lord, please bring it to my attention. Please make me go into a sorrowful contrition before you, Lord, so that you would bring me, because the Lord brings us back into repentance. And I always want to be ready for the Lord to return at any time. And so that's what these people should have been doing. That's what these people should have been doing, right? So you have condemned and you have murdered the righteous. Who does not resist you? So there you can see that their lifestyle turned into sin. It, it, it just, it, it led to sin, you know? So the love of the love of the money, the love of power caused them to do evil things in God's eyes. And it's causing them obviously to live a life of sin, um, condemning others even it says even murdering the righteous you have murdered the righteous and you and who does not resist you so even though they might have power and they might have wealth and prestige and whatever else uh, that is of the earthly realm it doesn't matter because people resist them people don't like them people are 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 even before god approaching his throne um to come against them so wow that's powerful right Okay, so we're going to move on to verse 7 through a, let's see, 7 through 11. And this is going to go on to a different topic. So we're kind of leaving the warning of the rich. And mine is called Waiting for the Lord. So I'm going to read verse 7 through 11. So join me here. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. Okay. Um, see how the farmer waits for the pre for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receive until it receives the early and the late rains. You must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord is coming near. Verse 9. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Verse 10, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord has brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Amen. All right, so real quick, I just want to point out... Um, I forgot to mention before, like verse four real quick, the Lord is aware of all corruption and justice cries out before him. So I kind of said that. I don't want to forget to say these few little notes I put. Verse five and six, be aware that God sees the corruption and evil and this behavior is going to be judged by him. Sorry, I just had to throw that back in there. So be careful what, be careful with what God blesses you and serve him with what he has given you. Okay, so verse seven, um, we are to be patient and press in the good work, or sorry, press on in the good work of sharing the gospel with the lost, who will be our harvest, okay? We are to live holy and pure lives and to remain strong in faith. The Lord is coming and we should keep our hearts, minds, and our eyes on Jesus. So let's always remember that the Lord is coming back. He can come back anytime and we need to be about the Lord's business. And whatever God has given you, whatever time, treasure, talents that he has put into you and giftings, that you should be busy doing the Lord's work, whatever that looks like to you. If the Lord has given you a ministry, guess what? He gives everybody ministries. You know, do you have children? Your children are, are a ministry unto God, that God has blessed you with them and you are to raise them knowing the Lord, knowing scripture, knowing Jesus Christ leading them into a life of understanding God's word, who Jesus is, understanding the cross, and um, bringing them into the kingdom of God so they can be uh, warriors and soldiers for the Lord and, and carry the gospel, the Great Commission. So, you know, if, you, if you're if you in, if the Lord has blessed you with a beautiful career and you have people underneath you, like you're supposed to be a good example. You're supposed to be a Christ 
self-centered boss, okay? People should know that you're a believer. You don't have to go around preaching and all that kind of stuff at work, but they should know that you're different and they should see that you have different standards and that um, that you are Christ-like in your behavior and your attitude and, and how you live your life. So these are all types of ministries. You, When we think of ministry, we think of like, oh, we're a pastor or a preacher or, you know, like we're a teacher and, you know, but no, I mean, we can be the, the, the everyday mundane stuff and, and the people in our lives every day, our neighbors, everyone that we're in contact with, you know, from our children to in our workplace, to our family members, those are people that are in our lives because God has placed them in our lives and we are supposed to be witnessing to them. We're supposed to be leading them to Christ and that in itself is a ministry. So we're all called to that. So, um, all right. So first, so just think about that when it's saying verse seven and uh, verse nine, brothers and sisters, don't complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Um, I'm really like paying attention to that word called th that phrase or, you know, the complaint in here, like brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Um, so in other words, don't, go around and be critical. Don't have a critical spirit. Don't be sitting there complaining to everyone. Oh, you're going to go and you're going to complain about brother this or sister that, you know, you should be like going, if you have a problem with somebody, first of all, you know, you should be addressing it with them and not aligning yourself with sitting there and gossiping and like, it can turn to gossip and slander. And, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to, cause disunity in the body of Christ. Um, and it's better to go to to the person that, you know, you have a problem with and you have a, a, you're having an issue or a disagreement or you're like, I don't really agree with this or that. You should be going to that person directly, okay? And then when it can't be, uh, you know, solved, then you take it to the elders and, you know, you get some people involved. Biblically, it teaches you, um, the, the Bible teaches you how to, to solve those type of things. And I can't off the top of my head right now. I think it involves getting elders and all that. But yeah, so, um, you know, don't, don't be the judge of your brothers and sisters. And now it's not saying here, don't judge, okay? Because, you know, some people are like, oh no, you know, you shouldn't judge. You know, you, you're, you're being a hypocrite by judging because, you know, Jesus doesn't want us to judge. No, Jesus wants us to judge but he wants us to judge righteously. And there's a difference between having a critical spirit, slandering somebody, um, trying to just nitpick and be evil spirited about stuff and trying to cause division like in our, you know, knowingly or unknowingly, just working and operating in that type of critical spirit and, and complaining about others all the time. And, and um, so that's not good, you guys. That's not the same thing as righteously judging somebody because... You're like, they're doing something unethical, unbiblical. Um, they're teaching something that's heresy. That's different. We're supposed to judge. We're supposed to judge those type of things. But this is a talking specifically about complaining. You know, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. So it's almost implying that what you're doing is wrong. It's, it's, it's implying what you're doing is wrong and that God will judge you. Okay? So... Um, look, the judge stands at the door. Who's the judge? God. He's looking and he's watching you. And he's watching you being critical and having a mean spirit about you and coming at people um, in a slanderous way. And that's not godly. That is not godly. Okay. So let me see if I added anything else to you. Okay. It says, um, instead of being a judge, like don't be a judge of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Instead, Pray for them and be a wise counselor ready to be able to be used to encourage your church family, right? You should be edifying. You should be encouraging. If you see somebody, um, you know, you're like, oh, I just, I, I, I have a trouble with that. They're not quite, I kind of see like they're moving a little bit towards sinning or, you know, their, their behavior's not in alignment with God's word. We'll go talk to them and try to encourage them and be like, hey, can I have a sit down conversation with you? Like, is there anything going on in your life right now? I just, you know, I care about you. I want to pray for you. Like, is there anything I can pray with you? 
and you know I've been noticing you've been struggling in these areas and I just you know maybe you don't want to talk to me about it maybe you you should talk to pastor about it I just care about you I don't want you to fall fall into sin or or whatever so instead or just pray for them privately maybe you don't even want to approach them maybe it's not in the best interest that you do maybe you you know you power there's power and prayer and there's healing in prayer. And there's so much good that can come from a prayer for heart for people and for others and your brothers and sisters in Christ. So just remember that praying for them. Um, try to be an encourager and a good wise counselor to those who need your counseling and, and that would want to have that. Um, read God's word for encouragement and see the lives of the people who persevere. So this is going um, into um, when he's talking about in verse 10, uh, look at how the prophets spoke in the Lord's name, for example, of suffering and patience. So also there's that theme of waiting on the Lord, being patient and persevering in the Lord and um, how that we need to do that. We need to understand that the Lord is. You know, we need to live our lives as if the Lord is coming back today, but at the same time, we also need to be patient, <laughs> you know? And so it's this like teeter-tottering little area that we live in when it comes to the Lord returning and, and how we're supposed to endure through the suffering because this life is hard and um, there's trials and tribulations and there's, you know, look at, like it says, look at the life of Job and how he persevered and I'm telling you, like, that man went through so much trials and hardships and pain and grief and suffering. And then his friends coming, being Debbie Downers, accusing him, well, you must have sinned. You must have done this. You must have done that. And he's like, no, I didn't. Like, I, you know. And then God visits him and says, where were you when I created all these things? You know, where were you when I created the lightning? Have you seen the lightning storm room and all that stuff? So... It's really important to know that um, that we're in this, you know, tension of, you know, waiting for the Lord and being about his business and, and, and persevering through the trials, but yet knowing that, you know, living our lives as if he can come back any day now. So, um, so let me make sure I'm not forgetting. So read the, so read God's word for encouragement and see the lives of the people who per, uh, persevered in it, like people like Job. If you feel like you're suffering, then read as a reminder that you are not alone. It will encourage you. Like all these people have lived and suffered and still love the Lord, still, still went after the God, still believe they didn't abandon God, you know, and there is a crown for us. There's a crown for us if you persevere through and just keep on doing all that God is calling you to do. There's a crown for you. So just hang in there until the Lord takes you or he returns. Um, so learn how to deal with hardships by their example or mistakes. You know, Moses, murderer. David, murderer, adulterer. <laughs> you know, Job, like I just told you, like, you know, all, all these different people that Peter denied Christ three times when he said he wouldn't, you know, and, but the Lord restored him, the Lord restored him and the Lord will restore us if we chase after him, repent and persevere with the Lord until the end. We have to run a good race for God. Okay. All right. So. On to this, and it says here in the end that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Yes, you are, God. You are very compassionate and merciful. All right. Truthful speech is going to be verse 12. And it's a long verse, but I'll read that. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and let your no be no so that you won't fall under judgment. Wow, okay, so I like this verse a lot. This verse helps me out so much when I'm like, no, let my no be no, <laughs> you know, like, or let my yes be yes, and let me just do what I said that I were, that I was gonna do, you know, and um, it's, it's very freeing, because a lot of times if you have that personality that's like a people pleaser, 
that we all sometimes, you know, like I've tried really hard to like get out of people pleasing and, and to refocus on the Lord and be like, Lord, I want to care more about you. I want to care more about pleasing you um, than pleasing others and pleasing myself. Like I, I, I want to, I want to strive to like do all those things you're calling me to do. And I just want to make you happy, Lord. I want to bless you with my life and everything that you've given to me. And, you know, sometimes with blessing the Lord, it's going to come with saying no to certain things, you know, it's it, to please the Lord, to honor the Lord. It's going to have you, it, it's going to require you. He's going to require you to say no, like even something about going, you know, you have all these other things to do that you get, keep getting these offers, these fun things or work related things to do um, on Sunday. Let's say and you're going, you know, you want to go to church and you want to be you know that the Lord wants you there, you, that the Lord ministers to you at church and, and that you need to go and be with God in church every Sunday morning to receive all that God is giving you. And um, But somehow you keep getting all these, hey, do you want to come to this uh, Astros game or do you want to come to this, you know, whatever? Or can you work an extra shift or can you do this or do you want to do this? Are you, oh, can you... Can you come, you know, whatever the situation, I can't just think of all of them right now, but sometimes you, you're going to have that uncomfortable situation where you're like, I could go do that. And that would be a lot of fun. That would really minister to me too. <laughs> it would help me in my flesh to go to an Astros game, you know, but we have to learn that when we serve the Lord, it's going to come with sacrifices and it's, it's. It's not that the Lord doesn't want to give you those fun things any other day, but if you've made a commitment to the Lord to go to church, then you really need to, and you want to honor and please God, and you know that he's told you, like, I need you to be diligent in this, then it's going to require you to say no when other tempting things come around. So, um, and that's even in ministry, you know, sometimes you'll get called into ministry and that's a beautiful and amazing thing. And, and, um, but all of a sudden the Lord is like, Hey, your husband and your children are your first ministry to me, like above and beyond what you're doing in church or what God has you doing. And those things are good, but the busyness of those things, you can be, you can be busy doing good things, but yet if your family is falling apart, which is your first ministry, if your marriage is failing and your children are running buck crazy and away from the Lord, but yeah, you're over here serving other people and you're not even serving your family, then, you know, that's not, that's not good guys. So sometimes we have to learn to say, no, I, I'm sorry. I can't help with that anymore. I, I need to let that go because my family and my marriage is suffering over here, you know? So let your no be no and let your yes be yes. And I, I actually really love that. It's given me a lot of freedom um, when I'm with different things. So um, I just wrote here, believers should not make promises that they can't keep. So that's another thing. Don't make promises that you can't keep. If you know you can't do something, but you're trying to people please and say like, oh, I, I'm going to do, yeah, 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 I can do it. And then all of a sudden, and you know in your heart, like, you know, like, you don't have time for that. You don't have time for that. Um, but you're just trying to be a people pleaser and you're, or you're trying to game the system or go up and get, you know, promotion or whatever that is. Um, you're trying to people please. And that's not good. That's not good. And sometimes you just need to say no. Okay, sometimes you need to say yes. <laughs> sometimes the Lord will give you an opportunity to serve him in a new capacity, in a new way. And you're nervous because you've never done it before. And the Lord keeps giving you these opportunities to get in some type of ministry, to fulfill a calling that he has upon your life. And you need to say yes. You need to say yes, and God knows that you can handle it. God knows that you were created and made for that purpose and that you have the time and the investment and you have a healthy marriage and healthy children and you've got this time carved out that he can help you get into that, then you need to say yes. So everything being equal, you guys, between the yeses and the noes, it's all a matter to what God is sharing and teaching you in your heart, okay? So don't make promises that you can't keep. Believers shouldn't uh, 
shouldn't promise anything, not on your word, not on your mama's grave, not on your children's lives, you know, you, you not, uh, not by God or not by heaven, okay? Like, you should not be, like, swearing. Like, I swear on my mama's grave. No, don't do that, you guys. Don't do that. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't be like, oh, I swear I'll get that done. Oh, I, you know, like, I don't know where that came from or why people do that, but the Lord is against that. And he's like, let your yes mean yes and let your no be no. And so that you don't fall under his judgment. Don't make any oath. Don't make any oath, okay? It says don't make any oath by heaven or by earth, by none of that. Don't be swearing. Don't swear and don't make an oath, okay? Just simple yes or no. And if you don't know if you should say or yes or no, that's a good indication that you need to pray. Say, you know what? I really appreciate that you gave me that opportunity. Wow, I feel so blessed and I feel very honored. Um... I can't give you a yes or no right now. I'm going to pray about it and I will get back to you in a few days. And then you spend that time praying and asking and seeking the Lord. Lord, do I have time for this? Is this what you want me to do? Do I have the abilities? Do I have the character for this position or this job or this title or this ministry? And you pray and you ask the Lord. It's okay to say not a yes or a no. And just say, hey, I need to pray about that. And if they're trying to rush you and be like, no, 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 you need to give me an answer now. Uh, I would just be like, oh, you know, um, I will try very hard to <laughs> get to your ex expedited, uh, you know, answer. But at the end of the day, the Lord will reveal to you if someone's trying to pressure you into something and it's not of him. So there is nothing unwise ever taking some time for yourself and praying things through. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. So moving on, lastly, here to effective prayer. And this is going to be verse 13 through, it looks like, 13 through 20. Yeah, 13 through 20. So I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to break it down. So effective prayer. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they should pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Ooh, I love that. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Uh, 17, Elijah was a, hmm, Elijah was a human being as we are and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and for three years and six months it did not rain on that land on the land then he prayed again and the sky gave rain and the land produced fruit verse 19 my brothers and sisters if any among you strays from the truth strays from the truth and someone turns him back let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Wow. I mean, that all that was very powerful, right? So let me help you break it down a little bit um, for 13 through 20. Okay. So something that I wrote here is pray the prayers of faith. So when we're talking about here, we see that First of all, we're going to, as you know in life, we're going to have moments of trials and hardships and suffering, and we're going to have moments of beauty in life and, and, and things that are going well for us. And, and, and here, James is pointing out that if you're suffering, then, you know, there, there is some criteria that you should do, and that is pray. If you're suffering, pray, Okay. If you're having cheerfulness, if you are happy and your life is going well, there's criteria for that season of your life. And it's called praise. 
Praise God for that, you know? So pray and praise, okay? Good time, praise. Suffering, hardships, pray, you know? And to me, both are interchangeable really no matter what because I praise God even when I'm having a hardship and that's a, a, a heart condition before the Lord, okay? Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and that the elders will come and pray over the person, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. So this is kind of a, a instruction of how things are to run in the body of Christ. If you are sick and you and you need healing, you can pray yourself, but it's also a good idea to call your elders, call your pastors, let the people in leadership in your church know, hey, hello, I'm really sick. That's why you didn't see me there on Sunday. I was diagnosed with this or that. I need prayer. Please come pray. Please come anoint me. They'll come to you. They should come to you and they should anoint you in the name of Jesus and pray. And then the prayer of the faith, the prayer of faith will save the sick person. So this involves the people coming and praying and you praying and y'all coming into agreement when two or more are together. The Lord is there. The Lord is able to heal you. The Lord has a will to heal you and he can heal you here. Or, he, you know, sometimes things happen and he heals us on the other side. But no matter what, it is my belief that the Lord is always willing and wanting to heal us, whether that's this side of heaven or in heaven, okay? But nevertheless, the church should come and help assist with prayer and anointing you and laying on hands and believing in faith that the Lord will heal the sick person and the Lord will rise, raise him up. If he has committed sins, if you are a sick person and you have sins that you've committed in any capacity that Hey, during this time, confess, confess. It goes on to say, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. This is tying into the healing, okay? The enemy is so crafty, you guys. And if you are living, if you are sinning and you are opening up a foothold of, to the enemy to come in and cause infirmities in your body, to come in and attack you physically, mentally, emotionally, all of that, and you are sick. Um, it could be because it could be because you've allowed through sin the enemy to attack you in your body and in your mind and whatever else. So, so you need to tell your elders and your and your leadership, hey, you need to confess what you've done. I've been looking at pornography. I have had an affair. I have been doing drugs. I have been. Um, whatever your sin is. I have a, been a pathological liar. I have, um, you know, I, I have been really, uh, I can't think of everything, but you guys know. So we're supposed to confess our sins to one another in Christianity, not if you don't be confessing your sins to a non-Christian, a non-believer, but confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed, so that you may be healed because that sick person uh, the faith of the people praying as you're confessing and, and it says that the Lord will heal, will heal. The Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, okay, he will be forgiven by the Lord. Okay. So if you confess with your mouth and believe into the Lord and, and you're confessing to God, like, God, I, I've done all these things. Please forgive me. And you have a sorrowful contrition and you don't want, you are repenting and you're turning and like, you're, I don't want to do that anymore, Lord. And you're confessing your sins to other believers who can pray for you. That is so powerful. And you are, you're allowing the Lord to correct what you have been doing in secret dark places with the devil, quite frankly, you know? So you're allowing the Lord to come in and to work and help you in that area. Sorry, my dog. <laughs> okay, let me make sure I didn't finish it. Okay, so so pray, uh, pray, pray the prayers of faith. If someone is sick in your family, then pray for them in faith and send for the leadership or the elders of the church to come and lay hands on your family member or yourself and use anointing oil in the name of the Lord when praying for the sick. The faith will produce healing because it's the Lord, because it agrees with the Lord's will, okay? 
when two or more are together in prayer, the Lord will hear in heaven. And that's from Matthew 18, 19. Okay. So we see that the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effort or in its effect. Sorry. So, and then the scripture James is bringing up Elijah, the time that Elijah, you know, he was just a human being and, um, and he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. And he, remember, he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. And, and God listened to, to the earnest prayers of a righteous man's heart of what he was praying for. And then, and then it didn't rain in the land. And, and then he prayed again and the sky brought rain and then the land brought fruit. So, you know, when we're coming together and we are asking to be healed, we're inviting the body into our situation, meaning the church, our elders, and we're confessing our sins. And there is a whole lot of healing that can happen, that the Lord can do, that he can restore us in him. Okay. Uh, verse 19, my brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the church and someone turns him back, let that person know that whatever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. So if you see someone, you know a brother or a sister in Christ, and they're backsliding, okay, they're backsliding, they once were going to church, they once were going and fellowshipping with other believers. They were going to Bible studies. They were um, reading God's word. They were just, you know, you saw their walk was very pure and very good with the Lord. And then all of a sudden they stopped showing up to church. You know, you, you see that they're getting into some sins. You're hearing about some stuff that's happening. Um, they've confessed that to you. Like, oh yeah, you know, I, I just, you know, I can't show up to church anymore. I've really failed. I've been doing this sin or that sin. And, you know, they're just backsliding. They're backsliding. But, uh, and, and they're falling away. It's causing a falling away effect um, in their life. It is your responsibility to assist them back to God. As a brother and a sister in Christ, you would hope if that was you, that pastor such and such or elder such and such or the girlfriends you are Guy, the guys or the girls that you had when you were doing small group or Bible studies would call you up and be like, hey, what happened to you? Like, I want you to, I want you to come. Where are you? We miss you. We want, are, is everything okay? Is there anything I can pray for you about? You know, hey, maybe it might take some confrontation of people to come and be like, hey, I, I saw and I heard this. Is this true? Like, do you need prayer? Like, what's going on? What's going on? And so, um, and if you do that for people, that is going to save them. Listen to this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Okay? It's not going to save his soul from a, you know, we all are going to die an earthly death. But I personally think it's talking about hell here. You know, so, you know, you don't want someone to apostatize and just totally throw away the Lord and, and just get so far gone that they don't even want to be a Christian anymore, you know? So you should always care about people who are suddenly, who are once in there or, you know, used to be with you, but now they're on the fringe and now you hardly ever see them. And maybe they were never, maybe they were a false converted Christian and they didn't truly understand the gospel and that it looked good on the surface, but, but you should still go after those people and just be like, Hey, I want to, I want to sit down with you. Let's have this conversation. What's going on. If you do that and win them back to Christ, then you have done such a beautiful work of the Lord and you have saved them from his soul from death. And from going to hell, you've saved a person from going to hell who may have been a false convert to begin with. So I'm just saying that. And it covers a multitude of sin, you know, because you're bringing them back into the fold and getting them back where they, where they belong and where they can be forgiven of their sins and that the Lord can restore them. So um, pray and seek leadership and counsel and the Lord will make a way for you to minister to them in some way, okay? And you will be saving them from a spiritual death, and God will erase many sins by forgiving them. So, 
Okay, you guys, that's it for today. That is the very end of James. We have gone through in the Jumping to James series chapters one through five, and it has been a very meaty, 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 so good, so good uh, time with you guys in this uh, in, in this Jumping to James series. So I hope you've enjoyed it. If you followed me all the way through, if you've missed a portion and you want to go back in chronological order, please see my playlist and I'm going to link it right here and you can go jump in, uh, check out the Jumping into James playlist. If you're new to Christianity and you want to learn more about Christianity, look out for my videos uh, on, on everything that's going to explain to you about Jesus and who he is. Uh, if you want to know about different kinds of Bibles and books and my, my Christian books reviews, check out my playlist for that. If you want to know about my uh, testimony of coming out of New Age into a relationship with Jesus Christ, check out my playlist for that. Well, that's it for today, you guys. I love you. I hope this blessed you. Bye-bye for today. Bye-bye.